Um, I will now uh, welcome Dr. Patrice Lindry, Director of Stroke in the System Change Program here at Heart and Stroke. Good morning and afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today's webinar about mental health issues with our conditions of heart, or heart condition, stroke, and vascular cognitive impairment is such an important issue. And um, part of this presentation is in advance of World Mental Health Day, which we'll mention in a minute. So really grateful to everybody. We had over a thousand people register for this webinar, which just emphasizes the critical importance of these issues. And we're really grateful to our speakers today, um, Sandra Thornton, Krista Langta, and Gayla Tennan for being with us to help share their expertise in this area. So I'll just introduce our speakers. Uh, Krista Langta is a um, senior scientist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Krista is also the co-chair <laughs> of our Stroke Best Practice Guidelines on mood, cognition, and fatigue following stroke. So Krista just finished her second round of, of co-chairing those guidelines and has been a huge contributor to our knowledge. So we thank Krista. Um, Dr. Gayla Tenen is a medical and geriatric psychiatrist also at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and um, works primarily in their stroke program. So has extensive expertise dealing with people with lived experience in these conditions and also being part of the um, interdisciplinary team of all the people involved in stroke care and that's really important to have that perspective and also to be able to translate it within heart conditions. Um, our special speaker today is Sandra Thornton. Sandra is a volunteer with Heart and Stroke. She's a person who's had lived experience with heart condition and she's also been the co-chair of one of our mission critical councils who's been providing us with guidance and advice as we build our new strategic plan and key priority areas for the coming year. So those are our speakers. They all bring in a wealth of knowledge and information, and we really hope that um, what they share with you, you are able to take back and apply into your clinical practice. Our objectives for today are to recognize the importance of mental health with our conditions, to be aware of the key elements of the best practice guidelines related to this area, but really appreciate the importance for screening, whether it be for stroke or in heart conditions, and current approaches to um, supporting people who might have issues with uh, mental health. And really making this an acceptable conversation, our real goal is to re remove the stigma on behalf of people experiencing our conditions and then having um, issues with mood and cognition after, or with mood and depression afterwards. This isn't something that should be stigmatized and it should be more normalized. And we're really hoping to accomplish that um, and support you in your care of patients by doing that. One thing um, to announce, really exciting for us, that as of two days ago, um, we've created a new Twitter account. So hopefully any of you, was I, you know, normally I wouldn't ask you to multitask during one of our webinars, but today is acceptable. We've got a new Twitter account that's focused on, you know, reaching out to health professionals to have conversations about our conditions and the latest science. So it's at HSF underscore science. We will be tweeting throughout the webinar as we hear our three speakers say some really phenomenal things, we're going to tweet them back out to everybody. Um, and we ask you to join the conversation as well. If you've heard something that really resonates with you, please tweet it out to everybody um, and help us get this conversation going. Part of today's the motivation for this webinar is World Mental Health Day is October 10th. Um, we're doing this in advance of that to provide you with tools and ammunition. So on that day, you can be real advocates and spokespeople for the for mental health, especially in people with our conditions. Um, and really the, the goal of today and for World Mental Health is really to bring education awareness and advocacy. So we ask you to all join us in, in that movement. Just to give some context within Heart and Stroke, we have a series of different conditions that we are focusing on and working closely with people with experience, such as Sandra. And we brought these groups together over the last several months. And in every conversation with um, people with lived experience and clinicians, mental health issues came up in almost every conversation as being critically important. Part of Heart and Stroke's priority in the next year or two is gonna be the heart-brain connection and really looking at the connections physiologically, pathologically, but also common risk factors and common outcomes such as mental health issues. So we really think about the heart-brain connection and the continuum and really want to start integrating our care. If somebody has a heart condition and a stroke, or if they have a stroke and it's caused by a heart condition or with either condition and they're having either cognitive issues or mental health issues, 
we need to streamline the care because right now it's very broken and siloed um, models of care, which doesn't benefit the person with lived experience who has to be bouncing around and knocking on several doors. Um, so part of our goal over the next few years is to really look at breaking down those silos and today is a great opportunity. Within stroke, we know that the numbers of people with stroke are staggering and getting worse. With heart disease as well, with heart failure, the numbers are on the rise. And with our aging population, that's only going to get worse. This map that I'm showing you just shows you, if you look at all of our conditions, when I was talking about the heart-brain connection, any dot you see that's pink or red shows where there's a relationship between our conditions. And as you can see, there's more red dots than gray ones which is why we've taken this on as our priority area, and we're thrilled to launch it with this mental health webinar. So I will stop there and turn it over to our first speaker, who's Sandra Thornton. Um, Sandra, share with us your Thank experience. you. So first of all, I just wanted to say a thank you to medical uh, professionals, researchers, and Heart and Stroke Foundation, because Without the work that you do, I would not be here today. I wouldn't be alive. So um, I'll tell you my story. I found myself in the hospital just before Christmas of 2004, and I was in a state of shock. I had just had a heart attack. How could that be? I couldn't believe it. Over the next few days, I came out of shock and accepted the reality, although with difficulty. I was just turning 51. I was fit, active, not overweight, didn't smoke, and ate a heart-healthy diet. As the healthcare professional said to me, I didn't fit the profile. I did have a family history of heart disease, but I thought that through effective management, I could beat the risk. When I presented at emergency, my symptoms were taken seriously, thank goodness, and I was sent for tests immediately. The test showed that my heart was in trouble. I was admitted to intensive care, and the next morning I was transferred to the University Hospital in Edmonton and had an angioplasty to clear a 90% blockage in the left ascending or widowmaker artery. I went home and started my recuperation. I was bewildered, lost. How could my body betray me like this? How could I ever trust my body again? I felt every little twinge and I worried, am I in trouble again? I started rehab with every intention of getting back to work and life. And then one day, three months after my heart event, I was at rehab and I wasn't feeling well. And they abruptly stopped me from exercising and had me transferred immediately to the hospital with a suspected reblock. The very thing that I was most terrified of happening was happening. They found a 90% blockage in the same place and I had another stent inserted. I returned home and back to my recuperation, but now I was struggling even more with trusting my own body. Looking back, I realized I was deeply disturbed by the chain of events and I probably needed support beyond the wonderful help that I got from my family. It took me a long time to recover, both physically and mentally. I was off work for six months, and even when I returned to work, I didn't have my confidence back. This was uncharted territory for me. I think I felt that I had to be strong, and that the persona that I presented to the outside world had to be that everything was wonderful, everything was great. Fine visible sensations, that's not how I was feeling on the inside. But over time, my confidence and my balance of life returned. However, at the time of my heart event, they had discovered that I had a bicuspid aortic valve with some insufficiencies at that point, but not enough to act on. I was monitored for seven years, and then I had open heart surgery to replace it in 2011. The experience of open heart surgery is hard to describe. It is absolutely terrifying in anticipation, and it's like experiencing a major assault in the aftermath. For me, the surgery was not as traumatic as the heart event because I had had seven years to prepare my mind, as opposed to being broadsided by an unexpected event like a heart attack or a stroke. 
And because I was blessed to have a strong support system to help me recover, I generally felt positive and grateful that I was being given extended life. It did not, uh, sorry, it did occur to me though, uh, that those who don't have support systems or those who live alone or those who are facing other issues, the recovery from open heart surgery could be very difficult and very scary. After any major health event, you feel vulnerable. I recall a dream I had about three months after my open heart surgery. I had been experiencing some seepage from my scar. And one night I dreamt that my scar was opening up like a zipper and my insides were coming out. I was trying to close it with my hand. It was terrifying. I woke up and I went immediately to the mirror to check my scar. And fortunately, it was still closed. Every person will experience heart disease or stroke in their own personal way. I suspect, though, that the feeling of my body has betrayed me or why did this happen to me or how can I get my confidence back? Those feelings would be common to everyone, not to mention struggling to adapt to an altered body image and figuring out a new sense of who am I? It's a profound experience. For me, I was so shocked and bewildered that I didn't really understand what I was experiencing. I didn't know how to ask for help. I just struggled through. The good news is that was now almost eight years ago and I've been healthy since. And I am so grateful for that. But I do applaud the work that is being done to understand that mind, heart, body connection and what people go through. So um, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll address those at the end. And I would like to now turn this over to Krista. Thank you very much, Sandra. So here I am, speaker two. And uh, I just wanted to start out um, uh, could you switch to the next slide for me, please? It's Try again. It should be fine. Okay. There we go. I wanted to start out by highlighting the exact population that uh, Sandra brought to us. The brain-heart relationship is very strong in people with cardiovascular disease. We know that patients with cardiovascular disease suffer from various comorbidities, and those include depression, cognitive impairment, anxiety, and apathy. Um, we found that about one in four patients who've had an acute myocardial infarction will develop a major depression. And uh, Sandra, you'll be happy to know that we actually screen all of the people now who come in to cardiac rehabilitation right near the hospital, both for anxiety and depression and also for cognitive impairment. And our, our results have shown that even in people who are um, coming in for cardiac rehabilitation, so they're very motivated and they're coming in all the time, even in that population, one in four people met criteria for depression. And anxiety and apathy in those groups have prevalences of 20 and 27% respectively. So even in people who have had nothing happen to their brain and just have cardiovascular disease, there's still a very strong brain-heart relationship. So in people, the problem with that is that they have a negative impact on recovery. For example, in people who meet uh, diagnostic criteria for a major depressive disorder, we found in our cardiac rehab patients that the outcomes were poor. So poor cardiopulmonary fitness and body composition outcomes were found in people even if they completed cardiac rehab. So even if they did all the exercise and showed up for all their classes, people with depression had uh, less improvement in their fitness. They were also more likely to discontinue cardiac rehab and less likely to remain adherent to cardiac rehabilitation. And 
when you compare people who have these depressive symptoms to those who don't, in one group, post-MI depression, so after a myocardial infarction, increases your risk of all-cause mortality, cardiac mortality, and cardiac morbidity. And that's been shown in the literature to be a doubling or tripling of risk. In people who have cognitive impairments, even if it's mild and they don't meet criteria for vascular cognitive impairment, small degrees of executive dysfunction or poor verbal memory performance is associated with poor cardiopulmonary fitness in those with coronary artery disease and an increased risk of non-completion. And we know that an estimated 5% of Canadians over 65 years will have evidence of vascular cognitive impairment. And this is the group that has them, those with the cerebrovascular risk factors. We see almost the exact same profile when we look at people who have heart failure. So the prevalence of mental health issues in those with heart failure for depression, a meta-analysis of 26 studies showed that, again, you're expecting about 25% of people to have it. So in this meta-analysis, 21.5% of people with heart failure met criteria for depression. Anxiety is similar, it's about half, but about 13% of heart failure patients will meet diagnostic criteria for a formal anxiety disorder. So that excludes people who have even mild anxiety who wouldn't meet criteria. And both depression and anxiety and heart failure, again, have the same negative impact compared to people who don't have those neuropsychiatric symptoms. We see poor functioning and impaired quality of life, we see frequent hospitalizations, and we see higher healthcare costs. We also see, unfortunately, increased mortality rates. For example, if you have depression and heart failure, your mortality rate is doubled. Finally, moving on to post-stroke people. So over 400,000 Canadians are now living with post-stroke conditions. Stroke, in addition to having the same cardiovascular risk factors that we've just seen with the previous two groups, has the added insult of being associated with neurologic outcomes. So we see neuronal atrophy. Of course, we're going to have loss of uh, brain cells, as well as cognitive impairment. And stroke increases the risk for dementia. It's been shown, for example, in the Berlin Manifesto, we know that stroke doubles your risk for dementia. And dementia is found in greater than 25% of people post-stroke. So what are the post-stroke neuropsychiatric disorders? Again, we see the same profile. Depression is found in about 30% of people, and that's about a three times increase compared to people who have not had a stroke, who have been healthy. Anxiety is found in about 25% of people. Path pathologic affect or pseudobulbar affect, severe, persistent, or troublesome tearfulness, frequent and easily provoked crying or laughter. That's found in one in five people. And the same with apathy. So you can see that the diagnostic criteria for depression at the top have two core symptoms, depressed mood and anhedonia, or loss of interest or pleasure. If you just have apathy alone, which is similar to anhedonia, and found in 20% of people without the mood symptoms, you, um, you're still at risk for negative symptoms. So apathy is diminished goal-directed behavior. Interestingly, each of those symptoms is also a risk factor for the development of vascular cognitive impairment or dementia. In particular, depression, anxiety, and apathy, if you have those, it doubles to triples your risk of moving from normal cognition to mild cognitive impairment. And if you still have them and you have mild, to mild cognitive impairment, again, having depression, anxiety, or apathy increases your risk for conversion to a full-blown dementia. So today I wanted to go over, um, we're pleased to be just showing our first, our 2019 publication for Canadian Stroke Best Practice Recommendations that have just come out for mood, cognition, and fatigue. And um, there's three main points that that publication makes. First of all, following stroke, 20 to 50% of people are affected by at least one of those conditions. So that shows you the high prevalence. The second point if, is that if they're not recognized or treated in a timely manner, these conditions can lead to worse long-term outcomes. So again, bad news, but the good news comes in the third point. 
these uh, best practice guidelines emphasize the importance of timely screening and assessment and initiation of treatment across the care settings. So let's focus on post-stroke depression. First of all, the guidelines tell us who's at risk, and we know that everyone's at risk. So the guidelines in their exact words are shown in the box in all of these slides. So all people who've experienced a stroke should be considered at high risk. We do know that there are risk factors um, that actually increase that risk, and those include functional dependence or having a history of pre-stroke depression, but uh, Sandra made the point that when she came into the emergency room, she didn't fit the profile. So not everyone will meet the profile. So we have to remember that even if you don't have the risk factors, everyone is at risk for post-stroke depression because 30% of people will have it and they don't all have the risk factors. Why do we want to treat them? Well, because of the impact of post-stroke depression. We know that it's associated time and time again with poor functional outcomes. In this study, it was a systematic review. They found 14 cohorts that included 5,000 people. And consistently, there's poor functional outcomes when you compare people who have post-stroke depression compared to those who don't. And importantly, it increases your mortality risk. In this review of seven studies that had over 100,000 people post-stroke, 17,000 had post-stroke depression. And you could, if you look at the rates of mortality in post-stroke depression versus non-depressed, your relative risk is 1.5. That means that your mortality rate is 50% higher if you have post-stroke depression. So that tells us that we should be screening. So let's look at screening versus diagnosis. So here are the guidelines for screening for post-stroke depression and then assessment for post-stroke depression. In the screening section, you can see that almost everyone should be screened. All people who have experienced a stroke should be screened unless it's medically inappropriate. And if screening's positive, the next step is referral to a healthcare professional, someone who can have expertise in diagnosis, management, and follow-up for the depression. It's very important, of course, because we have interventions that have been shown to work. There are both non-pharmacologic interventions and pharmacotherapy that can be used to treat post-stroke depression. For non-pharmacologic management, cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal therapy can be a first-line treatment for depressive symptoms. Um, psychotherapy in, as an adjunct to antidepressants also has level A evidence of so randomized placebo-controlled trials that shows that it improves depressive symptoms. For pharmacotherapy, the first step if you have mild depressive symptoms or minor depression would be watchful waiting, but if it continues or if it's moderate to severe, there's strong evidence, level A evidence, that antidepressant medications work. Antidepressant medications improve depression, and they also have some evidence that they improve motor recovery after stroke and improve mortality rates compared to people who have depression who that's untreated. And finally, the more contentious issue has been prophylaxis with antidepressants. If antidepressants work and uh, a lot of people get depression and everyone's at risk for depression, why not just treat everyone with antidepressants? In the current guidelines, um, routine prophylaxis is not recommended. And the reason for that is that their impact on function isn't clear. And because we know that antidepressants have um, side effects, so you really want to balance the cost and benefit. However, you would certainly keep a very close eye on people who had a history of depression or anyone who starts developing symptoms of depression. So those are the guidelines. But now I want to introduce Gayla Tenen because she's the one who's in the trenches and dealing with these people. And she's going to talk to you about how these guidelines are applied in real clinical practice. And we're just changing places here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And thank you, Krista. Thank you for having me join in this presentation today. Um, I want to start with this slide, uh, which shows how much better we are getting at treating acute stroke, and more people are fortunately surviving, which is a great accomplishment in medicine. 
However, as already mentioned, we have many, many Canadians living with the effects of having a stroke. And our hope is that we can all get better at helping them with these ongoing effects. And it is the emotional effects that I will focus on today for this talk. I'm gonna be presenting a case that illustrates the clinical application of some of the key points in the best practices guidelines and what we've heard today regarding post-stroke depression. And though this is a stroke related case, many aspects are applicable to patients with heart disease as well. So this is a case of a 50 year old single female who lived alone in a two story townhouse. She worked full time in a job that she loved. She had no psychiatric history, so no depression or anxiety or other issues in the past. Her past medical history was significant for several vascular risk factors. She had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and she did smoke cigarettes. She came to medical attention with a left-sided stroke that left her with right-sided weakness and some expressive aphasia so she could speak, but she encountered word-finding difficulties often. She had some trouble with pronunciation and this got much worse when she felt under pressure or when she was stressed. Depression screening has been implemented in the Stroke Neurology Clinic at Sunnybrook. And so this patient screened positive on the PHQ-2 screen for depression, which is the patient health questionnaire two, which then led to her being screened with the PHQ-9 in the stroke clinic. She was then referred to me for an urgent assessment as she was experiencing hopelessness and was not able to do her rehab. This is a common problem. Depression makes it difficult to engage in rehab and also makes it difficult to work on the positive lifestyle changes that are often recommended after a stroke or cardiac event, including taking medications regularly when people aren't used to taking medications or stopping smoking or substances and starting regular exercise programs or rehab. For this patient, speech therapy, physiotherapy and occupational therapy were so important for her ongoing recovery. So it was a really good thing that they screened for and detected the potential depression. I just wanna show you what the PHQ screen looks like. There are several validated screening tools that you can access in the best practice recommendations document. In this scale, scores of five, 10, 15, and 20 represent cutoff points for degrees of possible depression. In the post-stroke literature, a score of 10 or over has the best accuracy for screening post-stroke depression. So the PHQ-2 is an abbreviated version that can be used as a first step screen. And it asks just the first two questions of the PHQ-9. So little interest or pleasure in doing things or feeling down, depressed or hopeless. On that scale, a score of three or more would indicate a need for further screening with the PHQ-9. And so that's exactly what the stroke clinic did in this case. So this patient had onset of depressive symptoms about three to four months after her stroke. She said she initially felt distressed around the time of the stroke, but then she actually felt very positive in hospital and as she started rehab. Her family all came to support her. She was making progress in her recovery and she felt really good about that. It was once she went home that she started experiencing depressive symptoms. So she couldn't do the stairs in her townhouse and had to move to a one level apartment. She could no longer drive and felt that she lost her independence in this. She could not return to the work that she loved. And she started to notice all the things that she wasn't able to do independently anymore. Her support system also tapered off as people returned to work and she was alone a lot of the time. When I saw her in assessment, she presented with very low mood, loss of interest, couldn't enjoy things except her family and her family's dog. She reported crying much more than ever before, and she was very tearful throughout the assessment with me. She reported trouble sleeping, poor appetite with a 10 pound weight loss since her stroke, low energy, poor concentration, and she expressed feelings of worthlessness and hopelessness. She said she had wished she had died at the time of the stroke and often wished she were dead now because life was just too hard. She did not report any thoughts of wanting to harm herself or end her life, and she felt safe in this regard. She generally just said she felt very overwhelmed and she did want to get better and she did want help. So you can see from the symptoms that I went through, she had many symptoms of depression. And so she fit within the diagnosis of post-stroke depression. We diagnose depression and medical illness using the same diagnostic criteria as a major depressive episode with no medical illness. 
So there were a few first steps in helping her. And one of the first ones was to help her access appointments and access medications reliably. So she um, I was having trouble with Wheeltrans to come to appointments because when she felt pressured on the phone with her aphasia, it became a real barrier, barrier for her to communicate effectively. Um, if it were today, we could also potentially do telemedicine appointments, but that wasn't available then. Uh, my office helped her to arrange medication delivery from her pharmacy because that also proved difficult to be reordering refills over the phone. We discussed treatment options to see what she was interested in pursuing, and she really was motivated to try everything. We spent time providing education about post-stroke depression and the treatment options, as all of this was very new to her. It was important for her to hear that we treat depression as a medical illness and not, we don't consider it as a personal weakness or a character flaw, which I think it's pretty common that people do think that there's something wrong with them personally if they feel this way. So that was helpful to her. We also looked at optimizing medical conditions that could be contributing to her mood state and fatigue. And this involved liaising with other members of the team, her family physician to check her low ferritin level, which could impact her mood and energy, her stroke neurologist to reevaluate an anti-seizure medication that had mood side effects and they didn't think that she actually needed the medicine anymore. We also tried to link her to a social worker to assist with disability insurance steps, which she was quite overwhelmed by and couldn't take those steps on her own. She clearly had a diagnos diagnosis of depression and it was quite severe, so I didn't think that watchful waiting was a reasonable option in this case, and she was also receptive to a new medication trial. No one drug class has been found to be superior for post-stroke depression treatment. In this case, a different doctor had started venlafaxine, the brand name is Effexor, two to three weeks prior to her seeing me. I think it was a reasonable option, but she had significant side effects of feeling dizzy and anxious. And I think that may have happened because the dosing was um, raised very quickly. It was aggressive dosing. So it's important to tailor the treatment to your patient. We decided to try an SSRI, which was sertraline, the other name for that is Zoloft, for the new medication trial. The saying, start low, go slow, but get there, applies to many of our patients with medical illness and they often benefit from that approach. So I prepared her for potential side effects, the likely dose increases that we would need to go through and that it typically medicine takes weeks to work. I also warned her about rare but serious side effects, which we'll touch upon in a minute. And I saw her regularly in follow up. So it's important to be aware of and inform your patients of potential medication side effects, which can help with their understanding and also with medication adherence. Generally, the medications that we use to treat depression and stroke are safe. The common side effects tend to resolve like GI upset, headaches, sleep changes, sexual side effects tend to continue on going, but patients should be informed about rare but serious side effects and they should be monitored for these. Um, for a more complete list, please see the best practices guidelines, which includes additional safety considerations from big things to small things. For example, some medicines raise blood pressure. If you choose one of those medicines, it's important to know that you would want to monitor that. It's also important to be aware of potential adverse drug interactions, particularly when patients are taking multiple medications. Antidepressant medications that pose the highest risk of interaction affect several metabolic pathways. And so you can see the boxes of those with the highest risk of interactions and the lowest risk of interactions based on what they do in the metabolic pathway for medications. I also want to mention that though many of our patients are moving towards other anticoagulation agents, for those that take warfarin with its narrow therapeutic window, it's important to monitor their INR levels closely during antidepressant dose changes, and that includes when uh, medicine is initiated or tapered and discontinued. Getting back to the case, along with medications, we integrated psychotherapy. She had many losses, losses to process, and some of these, um, Sandra, what you were saying, some of those really resonated uh, in what I heard from her too. The why did this happen to her? and how can she trust her body? And with every little twinge, how does she know that she's not headed to um, you know, a new dangerous medical event? Um, 
she had various challenges to work through and we also worked with cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT strategies to address some of the negative thinking and fears. So along with pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy, we pulled in a lot of added factors to try and help her. Um, she took a mindfulness course, which helped her to learn strategies to help her be in the moment and to manage stress positively. She worked on a stop smoking plan, which she knew was a healthy, important thing for her moving forward. Getting out and walking and eventually swimming was very empowering. It relieved stress for her and it really made her happy because she loved how she felt in the water. Sleep hygiene was another important element in her recovery and it also assisted her energy levels. Reconnecting socially helped her sense of isolation and finding meaningful activity helped her feel like she was being productive again. This patient was very dedicated to her recovery and was able to re-engage in rehab as a result as an outpatient. And she ended up doing really well. So this is a success story in detection and treatment of post-stroke depression. I wanna to just touch upon a few overlapping conditions uh, that are important to be aware of for your patients. So Krista already touched upon some of these. Uh, anxiety frequently occurs following stroke and it's also very common in cardiac patients. It can interfere with people's ability, well, first for quality of life and to feel good, but also we see it a lot in hospital that they have trouble following through on investigations and treatment. So I've had many patients initially refuse or defer investigations because of worry or panic. And I think this quote reflects that issue. I had a patient say to me, I can't do an MRI. What if something happens while I'm in there? They were afraid, what if they have another event in the MRI? Then they'll be stuck, no one will know, and, and they'll be at risk. There are validated screening instruments for anxiety. And uh, the post-stroke patients, many that I've seen, commonly have panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, or anxiety symptoms that are comorbid with their depression. Treatment is often quite similar to the treatment for depression and can be very helpful. Pseudobulbar affect is referred to by several other names as noted. It often prevents as frequently, frequent and easily provoked crying, less commonly laughter. Patients describe it as, an, as uncontrollable and one patient described it to me with the comment here, I know my face looks sad, but I'm not feeling sad at all, which I thought was a helpful description. These patients are often assumed to have depression just because they're crying. And so they often, um, get labeled with something that they don't have. Uh, it can occur with depression, but it also can occur with no depression. Uh, either way, it can be debilitating. So people often find it embarrassing. They don't wanna go out and socialize because they know they could burst into tears at any minute unprovoked. So it's important to differentiate that. Uh, treatment with pharmacotherapy should be considered. If the tearfulness is severe, persistent, or troublesome, and typically it responds really nicely and pretty quickly to a low dose SSRI. There are other medications options as well. I'm just gonna loop back a bit to apathy, which Krista was talking about. So a loss of motivation, concern, interest, and emotional response. Oops, I'm gonna go back one. Okay. Um, it's another condition that can coexist with depression or may appear post-stroke with no depression, but it is different from depression. It results in a loss of initiative and decreased interactions socially and with their environment. So these patients often appear not to wanna to do anything. And so that's why people think they're depressed. Um, apathy does not respond to SSRIs the way uh, depression would. Um, and unfortunately, there's limited evidence for medications at this point. Those stimulate, stimulants and some other medications have been tried. More research is required. Non-pharmacological intervention can be tried, such as exercise or programming or music therapy. A patient's wife once said to me about her husband with apathy, if I let him, he would sit in his chair all day long doing nothing and he'd be perfectly content. I think this comment illustrates a key difference between apathy and depression in that Typically, a person with depression does not feel perfectly content. And I just wanna mention as we come to a close, delirium, um, because especially if you're working in an inpatient setting, it is a common um, occurrence post-stroke and it's also often mistaken 
for depression. Delirium is a sudden onset of fluctuating confusion, disorientation. Patients will have difficulty maintaining focus and concentration. Now, some patients become agitated, and that's the hyperactive type, which is easy to identify, but other patients may be quietly confused, and this is hypoactive delirium. It can really look like depression because they're quiet, they lie in bed, they appear withdrawn and sleepy, and they can appear depressed, but they're not. It's very common in hospital, and it is caused by underlying medical issues. So it's important to attend to the medical issues and the delirium first before trying to look at diagnosing or treating depression. And I'd like to conclude with just some take home points from today's presentation. Depression is common in stroke and cardiac disease. It impacts recovery, morbidity, and mortality. All patients should be screened for post-stroke depression. Uh, depression can improve outcome and quality of life. At this point, medications are not indicated for prophylaxis. And it's important to distinguish overlapping syndromes in order to guide your treatment. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I think we're gonna have time for some questions. Thank you so much to Sandra, Krista, and um, Gaila. Your um, presentations were phenomenal. And we've captured the attention of many people because we've been flooded with questions. So there's lots to go through. We'll start with the first question. Um, and this one will go to Krista. And, and then Gaila, please jump in. And the timing for screening is always a challenge. When would you most commonly see the onset of symptoms for somebody for a new onset depression? And when is the best time to screen or and how long should you screen for? And is there a difference between um, somebody who's experiencing heart failure, which is a more ongoing chronic condition versus a stroke or a sudden heart attack? So it's a bit loaded, but I'll let you guys tangle that one. All right, so depression can occur at any time. In fact, studies have shown even over the whole first year, you can, uh, you can develop symptoms of depression. And we really try to emphasize screening at uh, transitions in care. So any point in transition in care, I know we have a lot of different uh, people on the line and healthcare professionals. So if they're transitioning to your unit, it's it's always good to screen for depression. And Gayla? Um, yeah, so they say that the depression onset peaks around three to six months, remains high for two years, but even many years later, as Krista said, it can become chronic and a high portion of people can still have depression years later. So it, it's not like there's one specific window that if you miss the screening time, then you can't do it. So I agree that at key transition points, it's reasonable to screen. And if you think about that PHQ-2, that takes, it's just such a brief screen. Um, it's, it is actually reasonably easy to implement that at any time, even well down the road. And is there a difference between people who experience different heart conditions or stroke in terms of their initial profile or timing for when a depression may <clears throat> be? Um, I can speak to um, people with coronary artery disease and people post MI. They start cardiac rehab within about uh, 12 weeks of having their event, and uh, with 12 weeks, we see that uh, one in four will have symptoms of depression. So I think the profile is similar. We know just uh, backing up to what we know from the literature, just from the theory of it, the we, we don't know the, all the reasons for the increase in depression in, and the reason for the brain-heart relationship, but uh, there are kind of the, the psychosocial factors as well as the underlying neurobiology. And the minute you have, um, the minute you have cerebrovascular risk factors, the underlying neurobiology that's putting you at risk for these things is already there and it's always going to be there. So for those reasons, you're going to be at risk the minute you have any of these um, um, underlying diagnoses. So another question is, um, given Canada's geography, there's a lot of rural and remote areas. And there's real challenges, even in some of the urban areas, of accessing um, mental health support outside of the walls of the hospitals once that patient's released when 
the depression symptoms may potentially start if you're talking about you know three to six months what are, are there any online um, resources that can be used and other recommendations when you're in a resource poor area um, you know that's that's really difficult that's a difficult problem that we do face across Canada we we know that um, I think education and even if while you're in the hospital walls I think the education piece so that the people who are around you if you have a support system are aware that you can have these symptoms then they'll know that something's wrong uh, Dr. Tenen uh, gave the one example of apathy and one thing that goes hand in hand with apathy is lack of insight. You saw the patient was just perfectly content to, you know, and we've seen the same thing, sit in a room with the lights off in the dark all day and not do a single thing. So I think it's important to educate the family and certainly, you know, primary care physicians can, uh, can uh, help prescribe antidepressant medications if that's what you need to do. So antidepressants can be handled by primary care and we have, you know, nurse practitioners that you can see who can, you know, uh, help monitor the patient once they're on an antidepressant as well and play a big role. The pharmacist can also play a big role in counseling people on antidepressant medications and interactions and what side effects. So I think we have to, in the absence of, you know, some of the things that we're privileged to have here at Sunnybrook, we have to reach out and look at the community supports that are available to those people. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would also say that um, online, there are some resources. Certainly the, the Heart and Stroke website has, I think, a lot of resources for patients to look at. I know there's the, um, the stroke resource book for stroke in young adults. That, um, that's one resource that can help provide education and support for people and families as well. And, and I think the more patients and families that are aware that this could possibly happen down the road and that it's part of the medical situation and not just something that you'd expect everyone to have because they had this horrible thing happen, um, the more they can be encouraged and wholly empowered to speak up and get help to say, you know what, this looks at that depression thing that I was told about and I'm starting to feel that way and I need help for that. I heard there's treatment. And so then hopefully they can um, really take that and run with it in their care to try and get what they need. That's an important point. And it also helps emphasize that the depression is not the patient's fault. It's not that they're not trying. You know, I think we have to remove the stigma from it. And, you know, that's something that is available from the Heart and Stroke Foundation website that says that it is part of what happens to a certain proportion of people when they have a stroke. It's not that they're, it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. And just building on something that Gail just mentioned, one of our questions was around age. Is there a higher prevalence of depression or apathy in one age group versus another as we're seeing younger people with heart conditions and stroke um, coming to us? Is there any, does age play any role in that? It's a great question. You know, depending on what article, the risk factors that come out are different based on what research and what population they looked at, but age is actually not considered a risk factor. So, um, you know, I had a slide that I didn't put in, but I was thinking of just to show like a snapshot of the patients that I'm currently seeing. And I really have patients from 35 to over 90 and Many of them, if not stroke related, are medical illness related and uh, age, it's wide open for age. Um, and then as far as, what was the second part of the question, the age? Oh, for apathy? I don't know if apathy is as broad on age as depression is. I seem to you know, think it's more higher risk in older patients who have more cognitive impairment. Um, but that's not necessarily, it, that's not a given either. Okay, so here's another question. Excuse me. question. <clears throat> just, it's Andrew here, I'd like to just add something. When, when, um, when we're talking about resources for the individual, um, there is the Heart and Stroke Facebook Survivors Group. And I think that that's a really, it's, it's, a, it's a great group 
for um, people, particularly those in remote locations, to be able to connect with other survivors and find out what they're going through is not unusual. They're not alone. And they often receive good advice from their peers uh, when they need to get help or get something checked out. Thanks, Sandra. And, and I was want to pick up on some other points you made and, and direct these um, to Gail and Chris to get your input. Sandra mentioned the importance of peer support and how her family was such a big, you know, she had the support of her family and, and friends around her and that there's many people who don't have that. So one of our listeners has asked, is there any evidence about, you know, we talk about pharmacotherapy and talk therapy, talk-based therapy. Are there any evidence for peer support and social support beyond, um, you know, formalized talk therapy in terms of supporting depression and, and recovery? Um, we, we intuitively all recognize that it helps with respect to actual evidence. It's difficult to you know, you can't randomize someone to, you know, have good family support and not have good family support to, to some extent. So there isn't real hardcore evidence for that. But I would think from experience, we we recognize that uh, peer support and family support are incredibly uh, effective for people. Um, Dr. Tennant, do you have comments on that? I, I totally agree. I th sometimes we do look at the evidence too much when you just know intuitively is a person who thrives on social connection, who's isolated, getting them back to social connection will absolutely be important for their recovery and wellness. And also when we think um, just about a healthy aging brain in general, one of the things we talk about is stay social, stay active, stay stimulated. So there's evidence in those you know, that's more of dementia and aging brain literature, that it's a healthy, positive thing to do. Another really important question that's come up is related to aphasia. So we know that many people with stroke, you know, up to a third are at risk of having aphasia and the inability to speak. Oftentimes they're assumed to be depressed because they can't communicate. What is the best approach to people with aphasia to ensure proper screening and assessment? So in the best practice guidelines, there are a couple of um, validated tools that you can go and look at. Uh, one of them is called the SADQ. And instead of the patient um, filling it out themselves, it's based on an observer report. And so they will ask things like, are they frequently um, bursting out in tears? Are they having trouble sleeping and restless at night? And so they end up gathering information based on observations if the patient isn't able to communicate verbally themselves. Um, we do see a lot of people improve with, with speech therapy and some time. So, um, you know, sometimes it's a bit of a guessing game at the beginning. Um, and then hopefully over a little more time, even just a few days, you can sometimes glean a little bit more directly from the patient. But they do have validated tools that you can use that can be very helpful in guiding how to treat them. And then our last question, because we're out of time, but we're everybody's got lots of questions they've been sending in. Gilly, Kristen Giller both mentioned that um, when people start feeling depressive symptoms or apathy, it interferes with their recovery and their rehabilitation participation. One of our listeners is asking, if you've picked up their emotional issues, should you stop and treat those first before you enter them into rehab and delay their entry into cardiac rehab? Um, and deal with the emotional issues first, or do you try to do them in tandem? So I think that's an excellent question and one that doesn't have um, one blanket answer. I think in that case, it's case by case because it depends on uh, the severity of their symptoms and um, also their level of motivation and also their level of residual medical problems that they're dealing with so and their supports like there's so many things that go into that so there are definitely people who are so severely depressed you know it's just of such a push for them to get out of bed and make it to their medical appointments that for them it's better to um, try and postpone rehab until they start feeling a little bit better so that when they go um, they can 
have a chance of getting integrated in it and engaged. There are other people who, when they're not totally severely depressed and can kind of, they may not enjoy it, but they could push themselves to do it, um, then I would say do it because sometimes you, you really don't want to hold off on something that's so important to their recovery. <clears throat> by doing it alone, they'll, that will often help them feel a little bit more empowered and productive and like they're doing something positive for their health. So that can be something that is helpful actually for helping move their mood forward. So when possible, we like them to go in tandem, but sometimes we have to say, this is just going to be more pressure and more overwhelming. And we try and hold off a little bit until they're ready to handle it. So that's a case Thank you. thing. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we'll end it there. Sandra, I'm going to turn it over to you to give us the last word. What, what is your message to everybody, you know, the healthcare providers that are listening in today? Oh, gee. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that uh, there seems to be a growing awareness of the fact that people are dealing with what's happened to them on many levels, not just on a physical recovery. And I'm very, very heartened to see that, um, that that shift is happening and that people will get more support and, and feel that they're not alone as they work their way through their recovery in their own way. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you all. I mean, Gail, Sandra, and Krista, you're all phenomenal. It's been an excellent presentation and everybody stayed on right to the end. Nobody dropped off, which is a real tribute to all of you. Um, just to wrap up for everybody who's listening, further questions can be submitted at Stroke Best Practices at heartandstrokes.ca and we will do our best to address all the questions that have come in. Um, there was just too many more for, than us than we can get a hold of. This webinar has been recorded and will be posted on our best practice website and on our Heart and Stroke professional education website over the next few weeks. Please, when you get the um, notice about the evaluation to complete those and let us know what other topics you'd like to hear this year as we plan our, pro our uh, program for the year. And if you do need a certificate of participation, those are available at the end of the evaluation. You have to do it to get it. Um, but thank you everybody. This has been phenomenal. Thank you to our speakers and to our staff. And we really hope as you know, with World Mental Health Day, but beyond that, it doesn't have to be just one day. This is a really critical topic, and our patients, the people that we're looking after, um, rely on us to take away the stigma and make sure that we're dealing with the whole person. So please take that away with you, and um, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the week.